So good to be preaching at Nations Church. What a great church you are. All those watching online, welcome to you as well. While we are standing, why don't we pray together? Father, thank you for a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the room, peeling veils off our hearts, hearing truth today, shifting us. We want to we want to grow. We want to change. We want to be everything, Jesus, that you died for us to be. Thank you for speaking into our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated, everyone. Thanks, team. Appreciate you as well. All right. <clears throat> well, it's always a privilege uh, to speak the Word of God. Would you like to hear a story about how Pastor Ken and Chrissy met? Well, you know, I was, had my small part to play. We were doing this. We were back in the crazy days of anointing different university gates. We had these bottles and uh, squirt guns filled with oil. And we got it in our mind. We're going to anoint all these places. And where's, I think it was Curtin University, we're squirting away on the gate and we're praying over it. And Ken said, listen... I'm going to sit in the back seat with Chrissy. If you could take lots of left corners really hard so I'm sort of leaning into her, that would be great. So, look, it's my... F and, and it just blossomed from there. I don't know. That's my part of the story. Uh, anyway. All right. So I wanted to share with you something that's been very helpful uh, to me on my Christian journey. And I bring it to you in the hope... It's going to be really helpful to you because for quite a while I felt, you know, I'm reading all about this abundant life, this joy, this peace, this power that I'm meant to have. But to be honest, I thought there's a gap here, you know, uh, between my reality and what the Bible is telling me I should have. And I, like you, knew that Bible verse where it says, you know, we're transformed. We're being offered life transformation, but it's not automatic. It's by the renewing of our mind. And I thought I knew what that meant. I thought I meant, thought that meant, you know, you push all the positive thoughts into your mind and you push out all the negative thoughts and that's renewing my mind. But it didn't work. And I'll prove to you it doesn't work. For the next 15 seconds, don't think of a monkey. Well, you've already blown it. Because while you're trying not to think of a monkey, you're thinking of a monkey. So you're trying to push out those negative thoughts, but you're thinking about the negative thoughts that you're not meant to have. So I thought, you know, that can't be what this means. Renewing of the mind. But let's look at it together if you're not familiar with the passage I'm referring to. It's Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. But let God transform you into a new person. Wow, this is big stuff. But it has a caveat. It has a subtext. This transformation is not automatic. We have a part to play. We're bringing something to the equation by the changing, this transformation, by the changing the way that you think and with this new mind, this new way of thinking, that's when you'll know God's will. You'll be able to recognize it. And you'll be able to recognize it as good and pleasing and perfect. You know, that is a dramatic verse and it deserves dramatic music. Da -na -na -na. And, and the music's there to, wow, we've just been so, told something really important about life transformation. Some of you might know that verse, memorize the verse. You went to Karong, you got the fridge magnet. And so I'm rattling it off and you're going, yeah, I know that verse. But think about what it's saying. Life transformation is possible if we do something. We renew our mind, all right? And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to dive into what that actually means. I thought I knew what it meant, but it's not until I watched the way that the author of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul, unpacked it. So by the time he gets to that verse we just quoted, he's already told us what 
It actually means to renew your mind. The problem is sometimes we jump straight to the verse. We don't get the, the building blocks that he created to take us to making uh, that statement. So the first thing we need to do to go right back to the beginning to really understand Paul's meaning of renewing our mind, we need to go back to the beginning. And the first thing we need to do is become aware of the voice. Yeah. The voice. Some of you know that title as a, a TV uh, talent quest show, uh, apparently that's been running for many seasons, running for the 24th season, the voice. All right. But that's not the voice that I'm talking about. I'm talking about another voice. I'm talking about the voice that is the most influential voice in this room right now. It's been running your life for years. Maybe you didn't know it, but I'm up here with the microphone, but if, if this voice isn't agreeing with what I'm saying, then it will win out over my voice every time. And this voice that I'm talking about is your thought voice. You and I, by the creation of God, have a thinking voice. And if you're thinking, what does he mean I have a thinking voice? It was the voice that just said that to you. That's the voice. That's your thinking voice. So we've all, we've all got a thinking voice. But the thinking voice is now saying things to us that God never intended Thoughts are now coming into our mind that God never intended us to have because of what we're going to call the big mess up. We're going to get there in just a moment. But because of the big mess up, because your mind is now saying things to you that God never intended it to say, it was telling you not to raise your hands earlier in worship. It said, don't do that. People, people are looking. Oh, oh, I don't raise my hand. It, it's the thought voice that when we open up this front area for prayer, it'll say, you don't need to go out. Even though you desperately do need prayer, it'll make you stay in your chair. It will tell you, don't do that. Or oh, that's for other people. That's for those losers. I am perfect. I don't need that. That's the voice. It's been robbing you of God's intended abundant life for you. It's been talking you out of it. It's the voice that's even arguing with what I just said. Well, he just, how he can say that? Who does he think he is coming in here and telling uh, that voice? That voice. All right. And so Paul's. Paul's argument is, if we want to call it that, he's saying, how would you be different as a person if you stopped that voice? If you dropped out of that critical, judgmental, suspicious, evaluating everything mine, and you just said, I'm in. I'm, I, God said it. I receive it. It's true. That's his truth to me. How would you be different? I reckon if you dropped out of that mind, <laughs> then you'd be transformed. How did you get that transformation? By the renewing of your mind. <clears throat> so let's be clear. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a thought voice. I'm just saying it's saying many things to you that God never intended it to say because of the big mess up. You, you, God gave you this wonderful gift of a thought voice with the intention that it gives you creativity, gives you uh, the beauty and wonder of life, and you feel all that. But what I am saying is something went wrong, and now it's operating in your life. You know, you can think of your thought voice like a, a surgeon's scalpel. In the right hand, held firmly, it can do great things. But you hold that thing too loosely, it will cut you again and again and again and again because you are not holding it properly. It's not the, its intention. It's not God's reason. But if we don't learn what the Bible is telling us here, our thought voice will cut us over and over and over again. So in the beginning, let's go back 
to where this big mess up happened. God created humans. He gave them this great gift of a thought voice. They were incredibly intelligent uh, people, uh, great level of intelligence. And we're told something significant about these first humans. They were naked and they were not ashamed. Now, please don't think the Bible wants you to know they had no clothes on. What that meant is they were aware, but they were not self-aware. Thoughts like, am I okay? Is my, are you approving of me now? Uh, uh, am I all right with you uh, in your eyes? Those thoughts had never occurred to them. Those thoughts had never gone even through their mind. They were aware, but they were not self-aware. They were naked and they were not ashamed. All right? So, in fact, shame was non-existent. You know why? Because the self-consciousness that feeds shame has, hadn't existed yet. It just wasn't there. All right? So just think of how different you'd be as a person if thoughts like worrying about what people think of you... Uh, your desire to impress other people, your uh, desire to have what they have, uh, superior, inferior. Imagine what your life would be like if those thoughts had never come into your mind. I reckon you'd be transformed. I reckon we'd be looking at you saying, wow, you're so different. What had happened? Well, you've been transformed by what Paul is building up to tell us of a mind you got out of back into the right state of mind where you can experience God's life and peace. So these, these first creatures, humans, were in paradise, but then the big mess up happened and uh, they lost paradise. They, they were kicked out in their heads before they were physically kicked out. They lost paradise first here. All right? And... How did they lose paradise? Well, the Bible tells us God had laid down these boundaries for humans to live within, to live fulfilled functional lives. He told them, now listen, I want to keep you fully alive, but I need to withhold from you a knowledge that if you acquire it, you will surely die. Now the word die, look it up if you like, it means to lose your aliveness. They didn't literally physically die. They lost their aliveness. They lost the sheer wonder, joy, and bliss of just being alive. They lost it when they acquired this knowledge. So they reached out. The first humans were deceived into perceiving that when God told them, you can't have this knowledge, I'm withholding it, they saw that as a restriction and a hindrance to their, them reaching their full potential. So they wanted it. We want this. God's holding out on us. We need this knowledge. But it says the moment they acquired this knowledge, their eyes were opened. Again, we're meant to get it. Their eyes, physical eyes were already open. The eyes of self-consciousness, the eyes of awareness were now open. It means that for the first time, -na -na -na, for the first time, these humans became aware of themselves as they're seen through the eyes of another person. You know, it never occurred to them to think about themselves. How am I appearing in your eyes? Never appeared, never thought that way. And so now the desire to create in you, the desire of how I want you to perceive me, it matters to me so much. It affects my behavior. They, their eyes were open. And what brought about this self-conscious shift? They'd acquired a knowledge that God didn't want them to have. And, and this knowledge created in them Paul's language. So here's where we start to understand his train of thought. He said this knowledge created in them a mind, a way of thinking that they were never intended to have. 
And when you're in that mind, it will rob you of God's life and goodness every time. It will take away your aliveness. And so Paul then begins to build this thought. And in Romans 8, he says, in fact, the mindset focused on the flesh fights, not just, mm, no, it fights God's plan and refuses to submit to his direction because it just can't. It just wants to argue. It wants to reason away. It doesn't know miracles because, no, maybe, you know, they just, when they fell over under the power, their back went in naturally. It was like chiropractic and stuff, you know. It, it just wants to reason away everything that's supernatural and, and God-loving. All right, and so when we when we're listening to the thought voice of the mind, it's always arguing the resisting of God. I want to call it out in you right now. If you're sitting there, you say, oh, "I'm here today. I'm, I'm listening to another sermon. I can let's just listen to what this guy's got." That is your thought voice. That's your thought voice. You know why I know it's your thought voice? Because God would never talk to you like that. So who told you that? Where's that? You, have you even bothered to stop and wonder, where is this coming from? Why can't I just sit here and soak this up? Why have I always got to push against it? Well, Paul's telling you why. Because you're in the wrong mind. That's keeping you out of paradise. And so for the first humans, thoughts were now coming that they'd never had before. And these newly introduced thoughts started insisting that they needed to cover up, hide, and be ashamed. And you know what? It's been insisting that we do the same ever since. And now perhaps the best ways to grasp what happened with this mind that was created is to go to these visuals. Just some people learn better. You know, God was... That, this is... Paradise. This is everything that's in God gets to you without barrier, without veil, without question, without suspicion. Yeah. It just, you just soak it in. Yeah. God is radiating all this to you and all of it gets to you. But then we have this veil that came in that Paul's referring to as the carnal mind that acts as this filter. And and all the goodness and life and intention of God hits that veil and it distorts it. That's what he's saying. It's arguing. It's refusing. It's filtering out. It's filtering out everything that God intended. But even after the big mess up happened, God is still merciful and kind. And he goes out and seeking these now hiding, shame-filled humans. And we take up the story of the big mess up in Genesis 3. And it says, the Lord God called to the man, where are you? That was more a question for, for Adam's benefit. <laughs> God knew where he was. God knew you'd be sitting in that chair, in that row beside that person from the creation of the world. He did. Let that gently blow your mind. Wow. So this is not a really a question. This is... This is you going inside and thinking, what am I doing here? What's, wh where am I at inside myself? Some of you have retreated from the vision and passion and calling of God. And God's saying, where are you? Yeah. You've gone into your cave. Yeah. I spoke all these things, destiny and purpose and dreams. In the where on earth? What are you doing in this dark, questioning, suspicious mind place? And then the man replied, well, I heard you walking in the garden. But like I've done every other day to run and embrace you and meet you, this time I hid. And I was afraid. This is a new emotion never had before. Why? Because I was naked. And here it is. Da -na -na -na. God said, well, who told you that? What's that question about? 
Adam, stop, go inside. These are thoughts you've never had before. You were once naked and not ashamed. Now you're naked and ashamed. Think about it, Adam. What's happened? Where is this coming from? And maybe for you the question of, you know, who told you that you're struggling to relate to that personally. Well, how about we try some different questions. Who told you you were insignificant? Who told you you were worthless? Who told you you'd never be loved again? Who told you you were a lousy mother? Who told you your dreams are foolish and stupid and you should give them up? On and on and on we could go. And God's saying, I didn't tell you that. So where did you get it? See, if you're listening to that, you're not listening to God. So the question is, come on, stop, think. So the question is asked in the hope that we'll go inside and work it out. How do we work it out? Well, we we go back to the great mess up where it all started. The introduction of a knowledge that we're not intended to have about ourselves. So, So even though we're not told that Adam ever answered this question, who told you? Maybe he hadn't noticed because the th- it's not like the thought voice was now speaking to him in a dark Vader voice, you know, <laughs> some sort of heavy asthmatic breathing uh, type voice or whatever. I'm, it was just that it was saying different things. That's why he hadn't noticed it. It was the thought voice, but now it was saying things he'd never thought of uh, before. So what is the answer to God's question? Who or what is giving us these thoughts of shame? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, it's not the devil. He's he's building up to this statement and he says, I've got a mind in me that fights. He he says in Romans chapter 7, if you're familiar with it, I don't know what's wrong with me. The things I want to do, I don't seem to be able to do. And the very things I don't want to do, I end up doing them. And he's describing this fluctuation between these two things. See, it's the, he's telling us that there, there exists a mind, a way of thinking that is contesting and robbing us of the things that God intended Robbing us of the beauty of you being in this church service and really experiencing something other than just ticking the box, I went to church on Sunday. And if it's robbing you in this moment of God's intention, how is it robbing you in your marriage? How is it robbing you in your personal life, in your mental health? It'll rob you. It'll cut you. It'll it'll get a story going in your mind like a big cement mixer going round and round, cutting you every time. That's the thought voice, keeping you out of paradise. But how would you be different if that stopped? I reckon you'd be transformed. How did you get that transformation? By the renewing of your mind. So the main thing I want you to realize is these thoughts are thoughts God never intended you to have about yourself. And yet, sadly, we've been listening to this thought voice for so long without question. We accept its stories. It is now the story of my life. Not We don't go like Adam should have, wait a minute. What's that? Where's that coming from? No, we swallowed it hook, line and sinker. We don't stop to go, hang on a minute. Where's all this coming from? All right. And it's keeping us out of experiencing the life God intended. Look at what Paul says as he slowly continues to build this in Romans chapter 8, verse 6. Now the mind of the flesh. See, now he's now calling it straight out. Slowly but surely, but now he's, he's telling us what it is. It's the mind of the flesh. And if you're in that mind, it's death. What does that mean? It means it'll separate you from the grace of God. The word death, separation. All right? So it's a, it's a thief. You're in that mind. By the time that filter gets through, you get nothing. 
and get nothing of God, get through that. Yeah, yeah, he said God loves you, but that's for these other people, not for me. So it just filters all that out. God is trying to get it to you. He says, when you're in that mind, it's death. But guess what? The mind of the Spirit is life and peace. Now he's starting to describe how this transformation can happen. If you get out of this death mind, you get into the mind of the Spirit, you automatically get transformed by life and peace. So we renew our mind actually by answering God's question of who told you. We go inside and we become aware, wait a minute. Where's all this coming from? Because when I'm listening to all this erosion of my life, it can't be God. It can't be God talking to me like that. So once again, let's just look at these diagrams to see how it works in reverse. We get stuck in the carnal mind. It's filtering out. But uh, this is how transformation happens. Paul says you get out of that mind. You renew that mind. Go to the next slide Bang. No need for another seminar. No need for you to be educated how now to be in the mind of life and peace. When you drop out of the carnal mind, bang. You're right there. The light doesn't need to come on again. It just reaches you now. Why? Because you're in the mind that stopped arguing and filtering it all out. All right. So it's an automatic thing. Let's look at a couple of Bible passages to make this message even more legal. And we need at least a few more. Look at this, um, 1 Samuel chapter 18. I love this story we're about to get into. It's a story of what happened with Saul and David after he killed Goliath. We, we stop at the Goliath story. Yeah, happily ever after. Nope, not happily ever after. Saul watches him kill the giant, jump up in the chariot, David, let's go back to Jerusalem together. As they're going along, these girls, the cheerleaders, came out with their streamers, tight-fitting robes, I don't know, and they start singing. Saul has killed his thousands and David his tens of thousands. What a load of nonsense. (laughs) Were you not there? That did not happen. But the story began in Saul's mind. He heard it and it started. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is one of those rare places in the Bible where we're told what someone was thinking which resulted in their behavior. Normally we're just told about their behavior. The Bible is saying... Have a look at what he was thinking, which caused him to behave the way that he did. It started with a story. And he says, what's this? They credit David with 10,000 and me with only thousands. Next, I'll be making him king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. All right. So this was a story. It Listen. It never happened. Saul to David to his dying day was loyal to Saul. So this was a story of suffering about an imaginary thing that never happened and never would happen. Now you'd never do that, would you? You'd never lie awake at night rehearsing a story in your imagination that's cutting you over and over and over and over again. See, hurtful things can happen, but if it becomes a story of suffering, the event can happen once, but the story will replay a million times. You let that story get into your mind, And it will cut you over and over and over and over again. And sadly, that's what was going on in Saul. David was totally loyal. But the story had started. And the mind was robbing him of perhaps enjoying one of his most loyal people. What he could have achieved as a king if that story hadn't been there. But it robbed him of everything that he could have had 
All right. So how can we get free from this thought voice? How do we get out of this mind? Well, I've already told you. One is we answer the question. We, we actually answer God's question. Who told you? We go inside. We slow it down. And instead of unquestionably swallowing all these stories, well, I thought it. It must be true. Well, guess what? Your emotions will rise to support your drama story. Some of us are confused. I felt it so strongly emotionally. It must be true. No, you get a strong enough drama story going, your emotions will go, okay, panic, fear. Let's support the story. You lose the story, what happens to your emotions? No story, life and peace. Life and peace. That's one thing. Another thing I've learned is gratitude. Oh, Gratitude mm, pushes me out of my carnal mind, my me, self-pity, poor me, nobody understands. <laughs> mind. And gets me to, wow, what, what an amazing thing it is to be alive and see God's goodness around me. It pushes me out of that heavy veil of emotions and I start to realize the, the wonderful gift of life that God has given. Yeah. The heavy emotions are pushed off. The Psalms are full of men who were doobie dog down. <laughs> and they push them. You notice again and again the part of themselves they're talking to you, to in themselves, their soul. They're saying, come on, soul. Come on. Come on. Why are you... Down and quieted within. Come on, soul. I'm going to praise God. See, they're pushing themselves into gratitude. It says there, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. Look at, look at uh, Isaiah 26 verse 3. You will keep him in perfect peace. Come on. Whose mind Again, oh, perfect peace. No, no, you're bringing something to the equation. If you're in the wrong mind, you don't get any of it, right? Whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Another way we can get out of that mind is stop singing these songs in church like Christian entertainment. Stop it. All of them are declarations of truth. Stop going, I don't like this song. Mm. And if they sing it one more time, I'm going to ram that microphone down. down. It's the carnal mind that's counting. <laughs> that's 12 times they repeat it. If you're in the other mind, it's not caring. It's going, say it again. It's just washing over me. It's doing me good. It's bringing alignment to my life. That's what you need to do. Another way is... Drinking in the word of God, God's truth, as it's declared over you. Instead of point scoring. Well, I don't know. What do you think, Mildred? Six out of ten? Oh, I don't know. As you're driving home from church. What about you heard truth today? And if you fought it all the way, you got nothing. You're leaving here as dry as an arrowroot biscuit. Trust me, they're dry. Okay. Look at this as we bring this to a close. God just never lets up calling you into your right mind. He just never stops. You got to love God. He just keeps coming at us with that same question that he said to Adam, trying to wake us up. And a beautiful story here in Judges chapter 6 of Gideon in this wine press. Now, Google wine press. It's a pit. It's deep. It's a wine press, not a threshing floor, a wine press. And he's down in there hiding from the Midianites. And lo and behold, this angel comes and stands over the pit, looks down and begins to declare that he's a mighty warrior, mighty man of God. He's going to deliver Israel. He's going to be this fantastic leader. And look at how Gideon's carnal mind filtered it all out. None of it got to him because he just argued with the angel. He said, if the Lord's with us, 
Why has all these things happened to us? Where's the miracles? You've never asked that, have you? Where's all the miracles? It always happens to someone else. Mrs. Gafforp's down the road. Where's my miracle? You'd never argue with an angel. All right. The Lord's abandoned us. My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house or entire family. I love what the angel does. He doesn't jump down the pit. You're like, you poor thing. Yeah, I, I know how you feel. No, nah, no, nah, he doesn't. He just totally ignores everything he said. You know why? Because he's talking out of his false persona. If you listen to your carnal mind long enough, it'll build a persona. And you know why God ignores it? Because it's not his creation. I didn't make that person. You made that person. I know who you are. I know who you are. And I totally ignore all that stuff you're rattling off. So what does the angel do? Waits for him to finish and repeats exactly what he just said. Totally ignored him. Ignored him because God doesn't waste his time talking to your persona. Not interested. Because he knows who you are. And he just keeps coming at you. You'd never argue with an angel. You wouldn't come out the front here and we're praying for you and we're just speaking the mind of Christ over you and you're going, that's very nice. But if you knew who I was, you wouldn't say that. Well, guess what? You're down in a pit and we're trying to call you out. The word angel means messenger. What would you call me this morning? Not necessarily an angel in that sense, but a messenger, yes. What if I'm standing over your pit? How did Gideon get in that pit? He was listening to his carnal mind. And that's where it'll get you every time. I'm going to get the singers and musicians to come back and help me. You, You will end up in a pit, but guess what? God is so good, he will always send an angel to stand over your pit. And call you out of there. That's how the angel got him out. Just kept on declaring, I know who you are. Now get up out of there. I refuse to jump down in that pit with you and put my arm around you and agree with you. No, you get up out of there. That's not who you are. See, God delighted in making you. You know, when he was putting you together, he was thinking, wow, this person's going to be such a blessing to the earth. Poor gifts and talents and abilities. You were created by God because God wanted to love you. Now, what did your thought voice do with what I just said? Did it want to fight it? Did it want to argue? Did it want to push it away? What's going to happen when we open up this front area and say, you know, God wants to break stuff off your life, eating disorders, eating disorders. Some of you here, you've been, I saw somebody who'd been in a car accident and it's a repeated cutting story of anxiety. Even when someone says they're leaving the house, a loved one, and you get that... When you say be safe there, it's because there's anxiety. God wants to break that off your life. That's, that's, That's a story that's got in your mind and it's cutting you over and over again. Injuries that some of you, or a sickness that you've fought and got free of, but there's that lingering story that it could come back. So you're not walking in this strength that God and the testimony some of you are withholding testimony I'm almost got to the age where I feel like coming down and slapping you because you should open your mouth and give glory to God God's done something in you and I'm no no now look, if I say something, then uh, it puts me under obligation, and, and you know, and, and it could I could lose it. No, you've already lost it because you didn't open your mouth and say, "No, this is mine." I'm telling you, this is real. 
This is not sermon 23 stroke A. This is me being an angel standing over your pit saying, what are you doing down there? What are you doing here? Hiding there. Get up out of there. It's, the, it's that mind that's robbed you and groomed you. That mind has groomed you to accept fear and unworthiness. It has. It's groomed you. And now you just accept it. You're not even fighting it anymore. I'm your angel standing over your pit saying, come on, get out of there. That's not God. When you're listening to that, God doesn't talk to you like that. Come on. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. Close your eyes. Those of you watching online, this is a moment for you to put away any distractions. Because I know there's people in this room that need to get right with God before you leave this place. You've been invited here or you just decided to come and this is the message you've heard. Guess what? I think I'm your angel. You got into a pit. And now God's saying, I created you for so much more than this. And here's how we get out of the pit. Very first thing, we reach for the arm of the Saviour that's reaching into our pit, Jesus Christ. That's why we call him a saviour. We're stuck in the pit. We can't get out. It's his hand reaching down. It's you finally realising you've tried everything and you can't get out. You need a saviour, a rescuer. That's what Jesus is to us. And you need to make the first move. You know, in the story of the prodigal son, it was the son who moved first and decided to come home. And it triggered the father running down the road. You need to decide, I'm coming home to God today. Because your soul knows where home is. You mightn't realise it, but it knows. You tried taking your soul clubbing and into this lifestyle and that lifestyle and relationships and it refused to lose its restlessness. You know why? Because it knew this isn't home. Home is where your creator is. It's in the presence of the God who made you and your soul intuitively knows it. That's the difference in you being here today. If you've never come home to God, if you've never reached out and laid hold of the Saviour, made Him your Saviour, you need to do it today before you leave this place. Or maybe you are the prodigal. You know what the pig pens of life is like, but you've come to yourself. You've woken up. What am I doing here? And today, this prayer we're about to pray is a homecoming prayer for you. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Everybody in this room is going to say it. You can pray it right where you are without leaving your seat. The power of it is not so much the words, but the fact that you are using your free will. I am choosing Jesus today. I'm choosing God's rescuing help to my life. I'm getting out of this pit. So maybe you've never done that, never realized you had to. Well, you need to. You need to make Jesus your saviour through this prayer or you're the prodigal coming back to God, coming home. I'm going to lead you in the prayer. But I, while every head is bowed, every eye is closed, just the people up the back helping me. Who's here and they're ready to pray that prayer and they're saying, that's me. I'm getting right with God before I leave this place today. Lift your hand really high. Go ahead. Do it now. Push past the voice. Say, that's me. I'm getting right with God before I leave this place today. Come on. Up goes that hand. There's a hand there. God bless you. Right there. God bless you. You can put that hand down. Come on. Someone's broken through. Who else is going to break through and say, yep, that's me too. Who else? You're here. You know this is your moment. And I'm your angel bringing the message of God. Come on, sir, madam. Am I talking to you? Yes, I am. I'm talking to you. 
There's another hand over there. God bless you, sir. Wonderful. Another hand over here. Fantastic. Anyone else? So grateful for you people who are pushing, snapping that chain of restraint. Who else? Before we pray together, anyone else? Looking around the room. Come on. We're still... This is all right. Decisions take time. You ready? Who else? Lift your hand really high. See, if your mind's going, yeah, this is just manipulation. This is just... No, it's not. <laughs> this is God reaching for you. Will you reach back? Who's going to reach back? Anyone else? Lift your hand up really high. We'll see your hand. Acknowledge it. Lift it up really high. Yeah, there's a hand over there. God bless you. Just see that person there. Wonderful. Come on, we're going to pray together. Put your hand on your chest, your heart. Say this with me, everyone. Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you to be the Savior of the world. And today, I receive you as my Savior. Come into my life. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for cleansing. Thank you for a new beginning. I receive it now. And I thank you for it. Amen. Come on, let's thank God for those precious people. Raise your hand. You know, those of you watching online, you can log on and just let us know your details. That would be so helpful so we can follow you up because we take those sorts of serious uh, decisions very seriously. Very, and those of you who raised your hand, there's people up the back. If we missed you for some reason, make sure you find someone uh, that can help you, okay? Because this isn't just churchy stuff. This is critical, life-changing decisions that we're making here. So we take it very seriously. All right, let's all stand together. I'm going to open up this area. We're moving out of a teaching anointing to a ministry anointing. We're putting aside the teaching now and the atmosphere in this room shifts and changes. Because now, because we taught, we're embracing the very thing that was spoken of. And the anointing that ministers it is now present in this room. Absolutely. Don't you let that thought voice argue you out of it. So we're opening up this area for all of you who know, you know, that's me. I'm breaking free. It may be a shifting from your feet to here, but really it's a breaking free. For you, when was the last time you stood down the front here? You don't even know what the colour carpet is down here. You've never even been near this place. Don't you be robbed. The power of God is here to help you. Break every chain. Come on, we're going to declare this. And as we do, you come as we sing. Come on. Move. Break. Break. Break it. Break it off yourself. Shake it off. Break every chain. Break every chain. Breaking fear and anxiety, limitation, rejection, breaking rejection. I hear the chain falling. I hear those chains falling. Chain. 